Welcome to Study Isaiah, a podcast where we examine the language, context, and meaning of the book of Isaiah with Dr. Paul Wegner. I'm Tyler Sanders, and across from me is Paul Wegner, who's going to tell us the Hebrew word of the day. Well, today I have two of them for you. All right. And it's going to be crucial for later. So my, my two words are Alma and Betula. Alma and Betula. And Alma me emphasizes youngness. Okay. And Betula emphasizes the, word, the idea of a virgin. Okay. And this is going to be interesting because they overlap some, right? Because you could have a young virgin. Sure. And that would fit both of them. Or you could have an old virgin and it would only fit the Betula side. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. that's where that overlap is. Um, but they also have separate meanings. Now, when we're talking about this, are they going to be used in like a noun kind of form or is it yeah. this is adjective like we're describing uh, uh well there are nouns in hebrew but okay. uh, they will be ex- describing the woman in chapter 7 that okay. we're going to be talking about okay. verse 14 yeah and um actually batula is not there alma is the one that's there and that's what's going to cause the issue later on when we talk about it okay Okay. Yeah. So I just wet your whistle now. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and anyone who who did the homework. Yeah, yeah that's true. And read Isaiah seven. Yeah. Probably, I've heard probably more sermons oh. on Isaiah six. Yeah. You hear that a lot, I think, in our world. Uh, you know, missions, that kind of thing. You know, with yeah. Isaiah's calling. Sure. I think we've probably heard more references to Isaiah seven, even though maybe the sermon hasn't been about that. Yeah. Because. You probably hear a lot of sermons that come from Matthew. Yeah. And Matthew refers to Isaiah 7. Matthew 1, and yeah. that's where we're going to get into some, yeah. some details here today. Yeah, this one, this is a complicated chapter, but it's got such good stuff in it. Yeah. So I think, I think you'll like it. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's look at the first section, maybe. Okay, um, well, can we first go back just to chapter 6 for a minute? And oh, remember yeah, yeah. at the end, those we had some dates that were really crucial. Yes. And the, the one was Isaiah's call mm-hmm. at about 740. Probably the earliest thing we have in Isaiah. Yeah, now what I don't... Known thing. Yep, and what we don't have on here is a Syro-Ephraimite war. Now, okay. that's, what, that's what both chapter 7 and 8 are about. Okay. But they also go to 701. So, so there's two, t- uh, two historical periods between the just first destruction that we talked about in chapter 6, where Assyria, or, yeah, Assyria comes and takes uh, the northern kingdom off, Oh yeah. and the second destruction where Babylon comes and takes Judah off. So, okay, yeah. So we've got two times before that, yes. okay? Okay. All right. So our, what we'll be talking about mostly this today is the Syro-Ephraimite War, mm-hmm. and let's... Let's go ahead and get into it. Yeah, let's do um, it. So here's my my dates, uh, about 734, uh, 33 through 732. Okay. Um, it actually is a, about a two-year war, um, so that'll give you some clue. And basically what happened, and, oh, and, and all the information in Chapter 7 is actually, ha- or the, the first part of 7 is before it. Okay, so um, okay. What, what built up to the Cyrene for Might War was um, Syria. Uh, uh, you can see Damascus clear up there. Uh, Ram is another name for it, or Syria. Okay. So Syria is the and Damascus it's is, is oh, its capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very okay. top right. Yeah. Yep. Then uh, th- they got together with. Israel, the northern kingdom, mm-hmm. and what happened is they joined forces to try to get Judah, or King Ahaz, to be on their side. Basically, what was happening is Assyria was coming across. They knew they, knew they were coming. Um, they were getting scared, so they wanted to build a coalition on this side of all the people, like the Philistines, Moabites, all of those get on their side to fight against the Assyrians because they knew they were a strong nation yeah. and they wanted to stop them so they didn't come and overrun their country. Okay, so Syria, yeah, in order to protect itself from Assyria. Yep, good. Joined up with the Northern Kingdom. Yes, Israel. Good. Which will also become known as Ephraim. Yep. In this passage we'll we'll be hearing that and Aram would be Syria. Yes. Okay. Okay. They are teaming up to try to convince Judah, the southern kingdom, yep. to join them. All three 
uh, we'll have a better chance withstanding Assyria, exactly. the incoming Assyrian army. Yeah. Okay. Remember, we've talked about how strong Assyria was. Yeah. So these guys were afraid, to, you know, that they're coming yeah. and they need help. Yeah. So they want everybody to be on their side. And Ahaz is a chicken. He doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, there was probably some uh, things in their history where um, I think it's Uzziah, his father, that, that rebelled against Assyria and got in trouble. Mm. So I think Ahaz... Doesn't want to, yeah. Doesn't yeah. want to get in more trouble. So well, and this is the Syro Ephraimite war. Yeah. So, so they obviously don't get along very yeah, well. Form yeah. a coalition here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it actually oh, doesn't oh, work. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I think we know enough. So if we know that the date is about seven thirty three to mm-hmm. seven thirty two, what we're going to talk about is about a year before that. Okay. This would be before Assyria's come in. Yes. And, and, yeah. 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 The, the, the cyber Ephraimite war starts when Assyria actually takes over and, and, and starts fighting them. Okay. Okay. So so all of this is kind of a prelude to that one. Yes. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let's see what it says. Now, it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the son of Aram... Or I'm sorry, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. So you've got two kings, one from Aram or Syria, and the other one from Israel. Yes. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, now Pekah is called the son of Remaliah. Yeah. And there's a good reason for that. Yeah. Because he's a usurper to the throne. He's actually not supposed to be there. He killed the king before him, Pekahiah is his name. He killed Pekahiah to be put on the throne. Okay. And so, so Isaiah, keep, I, I think it's a jab. Yeah, so yeah. that every time he, he sees him, he, it, three times he calls him the son yeah. of Remaliah, yeah. rather than, uh, you know, he doesn't call him the king. He calls him the, well, he does say king of Israel, but he keeps calling him the son of Remaliah to yeah. remind you. He's not in the line. Yeah, and he's not supposed to be there. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I yeah. have been wondering about that because it does come up. Yeah, yeah. three times. So. And it's, I mean, I, I didn't just didn't, I guess my question when I was reading it, I mean, there's a lot of names. This first nine yeah, verses yeah. has a lot of names that we're not necessarily familiar with. Right. And uh, uh, that one seemed like an odd and why is an he extra thing? And you know? why does he say the son of Remaliah when it doesn't say anything about Rezin or right. or Ahaz? It doesn't right. really call them their son exactly. of somebody. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. He's a usurper. Yeah. And so he makes it pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, the king of Israel went up against Jerusalem to wage war against it. Now, remember, Ahaz is in uh, Jerusalem. The southern kingdom. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But could not conquer it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I always thought that chapter or verse 1 is kind of a big summary. If Ahaz would have known that, you know, he wouldn't have had to be afraid. He doesn't know that they couldn't conquer it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So this is like a introduction to the verse or the whole chapter, and then you go into more detail what's happening. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, verse two, when it was reported to the house of David, that's Ahaz, right? Yep. Uh, saying the Arameans have encamped in Ephraim. His heart, uh, so Ephraim is the northern kingdom now, so or Israel. And Arameans say. would be people from Aram, aka Syria. Syria. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, his heart and the hearts of his people shook like the, the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Yeah. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? it? Is, yeah. So you see those, those yeah. shimmering uh, leaves when the wind blows through it? Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that lets you know how afraid they are, and, and for good reason. Um, yeah, two nations. Against him. Yeah. yeah. And Aram, uh, Aram or Syria is a pretty strong nation. Um, yeah. In fact, they've taken over most of Israel by this time. Right. Remember we had talked about that, that they went down and took um, yeah. Ebi and Giz- Gezer there, um, yeah. which was their seaport, and they'd already taken Judah's seaport from them. Yeah. Okay. And and so this Judah's got... Yeah, yeah. Judah's got really good reason to be afraid. Yeah. Okay. All right, so they all shake uh, like, like the trees in the forest. Okay, and the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Yeshuv. Now, Shir Yeshuv means a remnant will return. Nice. The problem is you never know if that's positive or negative. Yeah. Okay, return. now it could be positive. A remnant would return to the Lord. Yeah. That'd be really positive. Right. Or 
only a remnant will return. Right. So that means most ooh, people are not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so we're never told, and it never it never does tell us why he's to bring Shir Yeshuv. Yeah. So it's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. What well, what would that be? A Fuller's okay. Field. Okay. Um, he, Ahaz is out checking his water. So a Fuller is somebody that cleans clothes. Uh, mm. um, when I was growing up, there was a guy called the Fuller Brush Man who brought oh. brought brushes and stuff like that to clean your house, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's a, it's a um, so that's where they went out to clean their clothes. Okay. And so when they they went out, he's going out to check and see if he's got enough water. Yeah. Um, so this is actually, uh, it, it, from what I can tell, it's up in the northern part of Jerusalem. Okay. So Jerusalem is uh, like uh, Mount um, Mount Zion is is yep. like where the temple is. He would be heading just a little further north to see w- how his water is doing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. On the highway to the. Okay. And say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear. Do not be faint hearted because of the two stubs of smoldering firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and, uh, and Aram and the, and the son of Remaliah. Okay, let me just stop there and make sure we... So he's. this is the first thing. He, God is really gracious. He's going to... He knows that Ahaz is scared to death, right? Yeah. So God's going to try several ways to try to encourage him to be have some faith. Yeah. Okay, the first one is he comes right out and tells him, don't worry... Israel, uh, Israel and Syria, they're just burned, they're firebrands, they're going yeah. to, which means they're, they're, they're burned weak. out they're and they're on their almost, way out. Yeah, they're on their way out. The, yeah. the fire's almost done. Yeah. Okay? All right. And, and so he calls them smoldering firebrands. And then he says, on account of the fierce anger of Rezin, who's a, a ram, yeah. Yeah, uh, and a ram, <laughs> and yeah. the son of Ramaliah, there's Israel. Yeah. Okay? Because a ram with Ephraim and the son of Ramaliah, so he's the third time he jabs him, <laughs> yeah. has planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabeel in the, in the, as king in the midst of it. Now, that's, that's interesting. We don't have any idea who the Tabeel. son of Tabeel is, yeah. but his name means um, God is good. Um, but it's interesting in the Hebrew, it's, it says uh, is um, that he's not good. It, it, it's a, like a play on his name. Uh-huh. So it's so in, so instead of the name God, they've got not Al. So uh-huh. so it's funny. So yeah, so it's, right. it's like telling he's not good. So yeah. it's, it's like a play on his name. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Okay. As king in the midst of it. Now we don't know who this is, but it makes sense. What what. Uh, they wanted to do is they wanted to have somebody on their side, right? Yeah, they're going to set up like a puppet. Yeah, yeah. Who will who will do now whatever they say? All three of us will be exactly together. Their, yeah, we and have we, to kind of take care of the king because he's he's not, Ahaz is not going to work with us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so does that all make sense? Yeah, that's their plot basically. Yep. Okay. Um, thus says the Lord uh, God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. So that's the second thing God did. So yeah. he told them it's, they're just firebrands. Then he says, don't worry, the thing that they want to do is not going to happen. Yeah. Okay? Um, For the head of a ram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. Now, uh, oh, we'll come back to this middle phrase. Okay. Um, um, then, and the head of Ephraim is uh, Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. Mm-hmm. So let's go to this next um, PowerPoint here. And do you see, I call it a circumlocution. And, and so what's happening? I don't know if you can see my, see my arrow. No, you can't, actually. All right, so Syria is the country. Uh-huh. Damascus is the capital. And Rezin is in charge of that. So yeah. basically what's happening is, is Ahaz was afraid of the countries, uh, uh, Samar- or, uh, Syria, uh, and Syria and Ephraim. Ephraim. And, and really what God's saying is, don't worry about two countries, just worry about two men, yeah. Rezin and Pekah. And if I can't take care of two men, then I'm in yeah. trouble. So, yeah. so I think this is the third thing that God's doing to try to encourage him. Yeah. Okay? So Syria... To Damascus, its capital, then to Rezin, the head of Damascus, and then Ephraim is Israel, another name for it. Samaria is its capital, mm-hmm. and then Pekah is the head of, of is uh, you know, the capital. Yeah, does that make sense? So yeah, he's, totally. Yeah, and so so basically, he's he's, he's shrinking trying down to, the threat. Yeah, way. yeah, he's trying to get his mind off the countries down yeah. to two people. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so that one actually is the, like the third thing that he's now done. Yeah. Okay. Now there is a little problem in between, and I skipped it at a minute, but I went. Yeah, you that to parenthetical see it now. statement. Yeah. Now, uh, does your Bible have it in parentheses? Mine does. Yeah. Okay. NASB, yeah, and some it. of them have it in uh, maybe um, like commas or something. Yeah, or... brackets or something. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a reason for that. That phrase does not make sense here. Like mm. Ahaz is worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Yeah, he's not, you know, because he's. It said right at the beginning that he's sit that that, that Syria is sitting on Ephraim's border. It means he's ready to come down. Yeah. So Ahaz cares what's going to happen then, not what's going to happen in sixty five years. Right. So why would they say now in another sixty five years Ephraim will be shattered so there's no longer a people? Because it's not even going to be sixty five years. It's going to be right. um, uh, Israel is going to be uh, taken off to captivity in seven twenty two. Right. Well, that's like ten years later. Yeah. So why does 65? Well, in actual fact, 65 years later, a guy named uh, Esser Haddon comes through again and takes more people from mm. Ephraim or Israel. And yeah. we know that because um, actually uh, Ezra actually talks about it. Okay. It talks about people that have come during the time of Esser Haddon's reign. And that's actually 65 years later. Interesting. So it, here's what I think happened, and this is going to sound funny, but... Um, I think that what happened is that a, a copyist coming through saw that uh, knew that sixty uh, you know saw that verse yeah. and knew that it happened again sixty five years later. Right. So I think actually he probably put it in the margin and and mm. out on the side and then just kept going. And in the, in the copying process, at some point it yeah, seems to in. be in, co- incorporated into the text. Okay. Now the reason I argue that way is because first of all. It doesn't make any sense in its context. You know, and just the flow there. Yeah, yeah. So why would it be there? But it is true. So I want to make sure everybody knows it is it is a true statement. That really did happen. Yeah. So how come it's in the middle here when it doesn't make sense? Yeah. And I think what happened is, remember, the, the text has been copied for... Well, several hundred years, you right. know. So if in the 700s is when Isaiah lived, well, it's in every copy of the text that we have today. It is. Wow. Yeah. So it's not like it's not there. Right. Um, so it's there. And so we have to figure out, well, how did it get there? And I think yeah. the answer is that in the 700 years of that getting copied to our, our the, the, the text that we have today that is our, our best Hebrew text mm-hmm. is from about 1,000 A.D. So that's... Oh, sure. Yeah, so that text was copied a long time. Yeah. But we know that in the Septuagint, it was there at about 150 B.C. Okay. So it's, it's in there, and, and we just it must have been is somehow incorporated in the text at that point. What a, have you read any other theories about how that... Um, is in there? Most people don't have a clue, and and, and mm. even even mine is a guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know, I, I've got it from other scholars who are actually argue that's probably what happened. Mm. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, uh, it, 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 liberal scholars or or people that want to uh, attack the text will often come to this passage and say, "Well, look here, you've got a problem here." And I this know is evidence have, of some kind of tampering. Yeah, and, and people I, coming in later and yep. filling in prophecy or something. Yeah, oh, only this one it, <clears throat> is funny. If if somebody did that, it would seem like to me, wow, they could have done a whole lot better than they did. This, this one makes it almost like a problem here. So it right. seems like to me, it almost has to be a copyist or somebody who puts it in because why would you put it in otherwise? It does. Yeah. You know, if they're tampering with the text, you'd think. Almost anybody could have caught that one and, right, and seen right. that there's a problem there. So yeah. why would they put it in? Yeah. And my only answer that I can think of is they put it in because it's true, but it just didn't fit in that context. Right. Yeah. Well, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the best I can do with it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so now look at that last part. So um, uh, if you will not believe you surely shall not last. Mm. I should have probably made this the Hebrew word of the day because mm. um, the word to believe and last are the same Hebrew word, aman. 
the problem is one's in, uh, they're in different forms. Okay. So one form, well, this won't make any sense you know, to the readers, but it's a hifil form. The other one is a nifel form. Okay. Um, and so it's like a play on the words. So um, if you do not believe, you shall not last. Almost like if you do not believe, you will not be established or something like that, or you mm. will not. And some translations, if you do not um, understand, you will not stand or something like that, you know, to try to get the idea that that's a word that's like a play on the words. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's what it is. And and that, now, once again, the Hebrew readers would have caught that, and that yeah. would have been a cute thing to remind them of what God was saying. And that's in the semantic range of this word? Yeah, to yeah. To say, like, believe, uh-huh. and then something about uh, yeah, to, being established or standing, continuing. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, it's just in a different form of it. Is yeah. this kind of serving as a warning, like, if you don't trust... Exactly. I have... Like, God saying, if you don't trust that I have control over this, yeah. you're not going to last long yes. either. Yep. Okay. Yeah, no. Now, that's actually now the fourth thing God did to yeah. try to get his attention. So, right. so God is actually... In my mind, God's bending over backwards to try to help this Ahaz, yeah. but he knows Ahaz is... He's, he's kind of a young king. You know, he's, he's just taken over. He hasn't been on the throne very long. And so... I understand that he's scared. So yeah. what's happening is God's bending over backwards to try to help him. And when did we say this was? Around 732? Yeah, uh, well, um, like it's, it's like one year before the Cyrus from Might War, okay. so we're probably at 734, probably. So fairly early, probably in Isaiah's yeah. kind of yeah. life as a prophet, too. Yeah. A couple years in, maybe. Yeah. Or a couple um, years after his calling right. experience. Yeah, so if, that's in, so if that's in 740, yeah. so we're six years into his yeah. ministry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, verse 10, mm-hmm. then the Lord spoke to Ahaz again, say, uh, saying, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it as, as a deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now, remember, we've talked about merisms. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, and yeah. so high as heaven or low as Sheol. So basically, he's saying that or anything in between. Yeah. So kind you could ask anything. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. So now, it, this is like the sixth thing God's done to try to encourage him. Okay, so he's saying, okay, Ahaz, I know you're scared. Ask a sign, and I'll do it for you. Yeah. And, and, it's, and he says it's any, can be anything. Hey, I've always thought Ahaz was not very smart. All he'd have to do is say, wipe out those two yeah, northern right. kings, yeah. and, and it's gone. We'll see. <laughs> it's, yeah. He doesn't even need to have any faith. <laughs> but instead, he doesn't do that. But yeah. I thought he should. Okay, verse 12. But Ahaz says, I, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, I'm not sure exactly what he's getting at there. Uh, Deuteronomy talks about not testing the Lord. Mm -hmm. But in this case, God told him to ask. And so so it would seem like to me, by not asking for a sign, you're testing the Lord, right? So so Ahaz has it all goofed up, you know? So uh, God's here bending over backwards saying, ask any sign and I'll do it for you. I would have thought that would have been a good opportunity for Ahaz to get some faith. But he doesn't. Maybe if you're very scared, yeah, it's kind of like the reality. If you can't see any other reality than kind of what yeah. you're looking at, I suppose there's no way out. Yeah, maybe it's like <laughs> I, I'm going to ask God for a sign. If it doesn't come, then yeah, th- everything like uh, my whole worldview is going to shatter. Or something. I, well, maybe I don't have any idea yeah. what's going on. That's here. interesting. I would have thought that he would have done that. Yeah. <laughs> then he said. Listen now, O house of David. So now, uh, remember, Ahaz is the king, or is the king. So he's the head of the house yeah. of David. Mm-hmm. Um, but it sounds like it's more broad, right, to the house of David. Right. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Now, this is Ahaz, or I mean Isaiah talking, isn't yeah. it? Because he's talking to Ahaz. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. Um, we don't know exactly what it means to try the patience of men, but I'll bet what was going on is that Ahaz could not make up his mind what mm. he was going to do. So he's got these, <laughs> these guys sitting on his northern border, <laughs> and he can't figure out what he's supposed to do. So I think that's why Ahaz It's not Isaiah enough to says be it. indecisive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think Isaiah is saying, well, man, you yeah. know, make a decision here. Yeah. You're going to yeah. push it even further. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to try the patience of my God as well. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. So now, instead of a sign that Ahaz is asking for, God's going to give him one. Yeah. So you can probably think it's not necessarily all going to be really happy for Ahaz, right? Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So auto- automatically, you probably figure something's going to happen here. Yeah. Well, the sign actually is both positive and negative. I'm going to go all the way down to verse 17 okay. so that you can see that it's positive. Okay, yeah. so here's what it says. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. The Lord will bring on you and your people and your father's house such days that have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. Now, let's let's answer that one first, because that's actually the easier thing. The verse 17 thing. Yeah, yeah. When it says, okay, um, what was the day that Ephraim separated from Judah? Do you remember that there was a point where in Solomon's reign where the two nations split? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we actually, we date that about 931, uh, nine, uh, somewhere in there. Okay. okay. Or, you know, I actually dated at 931. Others dated at different times, okay? Yeah. But, but something close to 200 years yeah. previous. Yeah. So what you've got is you've got a split in them. Now, in... in God's mind, that's the worst thing that could have happened. Then mm. his, his, basically his nation fell apart. Yeah. Okay. So it's saying that there's, there, there's going to, this, this thing that's going to come on you now is going to be worse than that division of my, of my people. Okay. And then he says, the king of Assyria. So that last phrase there, the king of Assyria, that's the answer. Yeah, that's what, the answer. What, yeah. what is going to be yes. worse? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a little tough for me to understand, I think, reading through. Yeah. That was, uh, yep. I wasn't as, as clear of, uh, I mean, some things are a little bit easier to pick up on. I, yeah. I was wondering about that. Yeah. Well, in the way it's written makes it a little hard, but but it's it's at the end of the day, the worst thing that could have happened is the king of Assyria is coming. Yeah. And that's worse than anything that's happened so far. And, right. and, and basically the and division still of the king. It's part of God's and, will. Like, this is, mm, yeah. the king of Assyria is basically going to be. Yeah. God's rod, I think is how we Yeah, yeah, saw yeah. It, we'll right? see that later, won't or we? Later. Yeah, later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we already talked about it, but it's later in this yeah. section. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So that's verse 17. Yeah. Now let's go back to verse 14. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and literally <laughs> it says, okay, the Lord will bring on you uh, will give you a sign. First of all, you need to know that the Hebrew word for sign doesn't necessarily mean it has to be miraculous. Um hmm. There's one sign in in I think it's in in, in Exodus where it says that uh, when when uh, Moses comes back from yeah I think it's Moses or no it might be Abraham when Abraham pa- no it's Moses sorry <laughs> when Moses passes this this mountain um, uh, and it gives it gives uh, something that's going to happen he, that he, at least it says he's going to pass this mountain again yeah well. Of course, you know, he's going to go in and out, um, mm. bringing the people. First, he goes back to get the people of Israel, and then he yeah. brings them back. Well, yeah. that sign is not really miraculous. It's just miraculous that God knows it, yeah. but not really a miraculous sign. Well, so signs can be miraculous, or they might just be normal things, okay? So what you've got here is he's going to give him a sign, and the sign is, behold, of in that word virgin there is our word Alma. So it's our, okay. our word for young. So it's emphasizing a that young she's woman. a young woman. Yeah. Okay. A, a young woman will be with child. When it says be with child, that's actually literally says she's pregnant. Hmm. Now, it, that ought to be a hint already that, that the word can't be virgin because because it, it's an adjective. It means she's already pregnant. Right. She's, it, it, an adjective usually means she's in the state of pregnancy. Okay. So, so already we know she can't be a virgin, at least what we usually think of a, a virgin yeah, right. to be. Okay? Right, right. All right, so it's a young woman will, will uh, be pregnant and bear a son. Uh, and actually, that's more of the Hebrew is, and about to bear a son, because uh, Hebrew mm. can show imi- um, imminent action, okay. and that's, this participle is probably imminent action. The bearing a son part. Right? Uh-huh. And, and about so to bear a son. So we're thinking of very pregnant. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, mm-hmm. the Emmanuel means God, God with us. With us right? Now, it is a little interesting. The word "im" can also mean God is against us. Um, in in Genesis or in uh, um, uh, Judges, um, that mm. that 
preposition can also mean against. So it's it might be a little play on the words. Um, huh. You know, if Ahaz doesn't get on board here, God's going to be against them. Yeah. But but I'll go with the uh, New Testament tells us that it that God yeah, yeah. Uh, God is with us. So I I think probably um, that's what the name is actually getting at. Yeah. Okay. But I just wanted you to know it can actually have both nuances, and yeah. so. It's kind of, uh, I think it, the Hebrew reader would have thought, oh, that's interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Now, do you remember we talked about a chiasm earlier? Mm, yep. Now we've got one. Here's, oh, here's okay. our clear chiasm. And yeah. let me just show you. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So Isaiah uh, seven fourteen. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Mm -hmm. Behold, a virgin, will, uh, virgin. I should have put a young woman mm -hmm. will be with the child or is pregnant and is about to bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Okay. Now the next part. He will eat curds and honey, and then the B part. At the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Yeah. Be prime for before the boy will know enough to uh, refuse evil to ch and choose good. See, that part's obvious. Those are yeah. clearly saying the same thing. Yeah. The land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So I think what it's getting at is, well, first of all, the 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 child, Emmanuel, he's, it must be a he because it's mm -hmm. the Hebrews letting us know. Now, it's, it's explaining something about what's going to happen with the child uh, after he's been born, right? So yeah. he'll eat currants and honey, and the land of the two kings you dread will be forsaken. So whenever the, the child eats curds and honey, at that point, the land of the two kings you dread will be forsaken. So my guess is curds and honey, the child would be eating that. Those are pretty common foods in Israel. Yeah. So I'm assuming that those would be given to children yeah. when they're fairly young. Right. You know, I, I know today honey is something you don't give to a child until they're about one or something like that because mm. of um, the way uh, they're, it, uh, honey is made, apparently, mm. um, you know, from the bees bringing stuff and, and oh. children can have allergic Allergies, reactions, apparently. Yeah. But as I understand it, in Israel, before too long, the child would be eating curds and honey, yeah. and it says that the land of the two kings you dread will be forsaken. Yeah. So he's, he's encouraging Ahaz to say... Don't worry. In a short time, it's not a long time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. These two kings you dread will be will be forsaken. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so there you've got a chiasm that actually helps us explain what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, now that phrase um, uh, to know enough to refuse evil and choose good. Um, that that's kind of, that doesn't help us much because that doesn't. Mm. Um, it could mean uh, like um, to, uh, that one um, to refuse evil and good. That word evil and good uh, are ra and and tov, and that just means good and evil. It doesn't. It doesn't or good and bad. It doesn't even mean evil. Mm. Um, so it could just be good and bad food. You know, uh, my kid when he was about. Uh, well, both of my kids, <laughs> when they were about one, um, if you if they didn't like what you're feeding them, it yeah. came out just as fast as yeah. you put it in. You yeah. know, so yeah. so it could be like in one year um, the the two kings you dread will be forsaken. Yeah, or it could mean um, a child who's like uh, about five or six will know the at least yeah. to some extent something dangerous in the environment. Yeah. So, you know, it could mean, Evo could mean just something dangerous or, or bad mm. in your environment or something that's good. So, so yeah. when I was telling my students, um, when, my, when my youngest son was about, he must have been about four, probably about three or four, somewhere in there. We told him never to touch the, sto the stove because it could be hot. Yeah. And so he would walk by. He wouldn't touch it, but he'd look at it and say, hot, 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 <laughs> hot, as he walked by it. Yeah. Um, my other boy was just opposite of that. You had to hold his hands. <laughs> and then when you told him the stove was hot, because the first thing he wanted to do was well, touch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so but but that could be uh, four or five when they know something yeah, dangerous in to, society yeah. or, or, in, or in their surroundings. Yeah. Or it, uh, the other possibility is it could be morally. You know, if the, yeah. and, and that would be more like 12, 13, somewhere in there, yeah. where they you, you would think they'd have some degree of moral capability. Yeah. Okay? So that f those phrases could mean anything like that. And so yeah. it's hard to know exactly the dates. But once again, it's, it's, it's a relatively short time yeah. rather than a long time, okay? So it's, it's not meaning years. You know, the, the guy's not going to be... 
35 or 40 because, yeah. you know. Well, and in B Prime 2, we, we see, like, it's before. Yes. They'll know enough. So yeah. it's like, I mean, there's still, it's previous to some, yeah. on some level. And, and maybe yeah. the eating curds and honey gives a little bit better yeah. clue. I mean, I would assume curds are still fairly solid. Yeah. It would be, you know, a kid who's on some kind of solid, yeah. or solid-ish food, yeah. maybe. Well, at least not milk from a mother, yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, now verse 17 is the, is, so that's, that's the positive thing, right? He's, he's now telling them yeah, those two, two kings he dreads yeah. are going to be forsaken or the land is two kings he dreads. So that's, that's really good. So he's telling yeah. him that Syria and Israel are going to be destroyed yeah, and you don't, don't have worry to worry about, about them. Yeah. yeah. All right, now, seven, so that's the positive thing. There's negative things in verse 17. Yeah. The Lord will bring on you and your people and your father's house such days that have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, yeah. the king of Assyria. Yeah. So that's the negative part. Yeah. So he gave him some positive things, but he also let him know. Now, we know for sure. Now, notice it comes on Judah, or um, it will come on you and your people. Now, remember, he's talking to Ahaz, mm-hmm. so that means on Judah. Yeah. So that'll be, um, we, we know uh, the king of Assyria came in 701, okay? Yeah. So that gives us some help. Um, the, uh, so that means that everything above that probably took place in the Syro-Ephraimite War, mm-hmm. and at least uh, the two kings you dread could go all the way to 722, right? Because because yeah. Israel... So in uh, Syria was taken away, and, and and probably the army of Israel was taken away in the Syro-Ephraimite War, because that's mm-hmm. basically what happened. Yeah. Damascus got destroyed, and their army and Israel's army got taken away. Yeah. But for sure, by 722... All that's got to be fulfilled. Yeah. Okay. So, however we do the uh, before the child can know enough to refuse even to and choose good, whatever that phrase means, yeah. we know it's got to be before seven twenty two. Yeah. yeah. And then we know that this part, verse seventeen, has got to be seven oh one. Yeah. So that gives us some really clear guidance as to, okay, all this is going to take place by seven oh one for sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So now remember the sign. The, the miraculous part of the sign probably is that God knows it. I mean, he knows he's going to have a son also. I mean, this child hasn't been born yet, but okay. God knows he's, got a, he's going to be a son. Yeah. And he knows about he's going to eat curds and honey and stuff like that. So, so he gives him what I would think is a brilliant explanation of what's going to happen in the next couple of years for Ahaz. Mm-hmm. Okay? And all the way down to 7, 701. Now, that should have been a clue that Ahaz should not call on the Assyrians for help, right? Yeah, right. And yet he does. Right. So so I don't know when Ahaz calls mm. on him for help, but he does it at some point. Yeah. And, and we know that from history he does it yeah. at some point. And so if that happens, then, then Ahaz had clear, clear guidance that he shouldn't do that, and he went ahead and did it yeah. anyway. He's already seen the sign. Yeah. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, so so I'm arguing that this had to have happened in Isaiah's mm-hmm. life. It, well, at least in Ahaz's time period. Yeah. Because otherwise, mm-hmm. why why would it make any sense to him? Yeah. Right. So I and would. You're, actually, you're referring to the sign. Yeah. The yeah. the child Emmanuel mm-hmm. named well, Emmanuel. In fact, I would actually argue that whole thing is a sign. The child oh. is is being born. Yeah. His name, uh, what it says about the, him, the and, and then yeah. and then all the way down to verse seventeen. Yeah. Now, let me just show you the reason I I go that far on the sign itself. Because hmm. look at verse eighteen. In that day, the Lord will uh, whistle for a fly. So, so it's saying in the day that these things happen, mm-hmm. the, the Lord is going to whistle for a fly. Okay, so, yeah. so I've clearly got into another section here. And yeah, in, yeah, if, yeah. if you look, verse 18 has that, verse 20 has in that day, verse 21, now in that day, and then verse 23, and it will come, up, come about in that day. So basically you're saying these verses are referring to this as one... Yep. Kind of one unit of time, one yep. period. And that every one of them, it, that if, if we wanted to see where the units are, mm. it, it certainly looks like it goes all the way to 17, and yeah. then there's a break at verse 18. Yeah. Okay? The reason I even bring that up is because I've seen scholars break it at 16, and I, I don't mm. think that's fair. I think, it should go, I think it should go all the way to verse 17, yeah. and then you've got these in that day oracles. Yeah. Okay? Okay. And now, and that's important. Yeah. You're saying this happens in the time of Ahaz, mm-hmm. and that's 
a little tricky, potentially. You mean when we get to the New Testament? Yeah, when we get to Matthew, right? Should we go to Matthew now, or should we wait till the end? Which do you want to do? Let's do it right now. Oh, yeah. We're in it. <laughs> All right. We're in it. All I right. mean, after we finish this, we'll get into the 18 yeah. to 25, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. let's get into Matthew. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Let me start in verse yeah, 20. Maybe 20. All okay. right. But when he had suggested this, um, uh, it was, um, they were go- he was going to put her away secretly. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and when uh, he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So that actually lets you know Jesus means salvation, and so yeah. that's that. Okay, that's how they'll know. Okay, now, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now wait a minute, didn't I already? Talk, we talked about in chapter seven of Isaiah that all that was fulfilled by 701 for sure, right? and probably earlier. right? So how can it be here referring to Jesus? Yeah. Because it just, it doesn't make sense to me. How can the child be assigned to Ahaz at this time, and all this, and it says, he will eat curds and honey, and the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken, and then it says, and, and yeah. I'm going to bring on a king of Assyria. And we already know when those historical time frames are, so how can this say that this refers to Jesus? Yeah. That's a good question. That's a really good question. <laughs> well, it, it's it's a good question, and just as a as an aside, we actually had you when I was a student. We invited you to speak about this. In in the title of your your uh, you spoke at a little club meeting we had for some students, but the title of your presentation I think was "Are there two virgin births?" Yeah, in the Bible. Yeah, because that really encapsulates. The this problem. issue, I think, you know, <laughs> yeah. because there's a question, I think, of how Matthew is referring to this yep. and, and saying Jesus is fulfilling this. Yeah. But also, if if we just don't think about it, then we're kind of saying, well, it's happened twice. It sounds So like what it. makes it so special yeah. that it's happening exactly. to Jesus if it already happened once? And, and we got to know that, right? I mean, we got to yeah. know there's only one virgin birth. I mean, that yeah. that's... We, we know Jesus is unique. He's the yeah. God-man. So So there's really... There's got to. This has to be a problem to yeah. think that there's there's a virgin birth in the Old Testament, right? And so either you've got to argue, either that passage really does refer to Jesus, and it didn't make any sense to Ahaz. They've just been waiting. Yeah, yeah. and it, and I don't see how Ahaz that would have made any sense to him. And certainly the eating curds and honey and the two kings mm-hmm. you dread the land. Yeah, those be, details were right. Yeah, that's ser- certainly got to be back in Ahaz's time. Yeah. So this was this is actually the problem that I tried to solve in my dissertation. Oh. Yeah, so so that's where it all started. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> here's here's my answer, at least what I think is the answer. Um, you should just say your answer is... Go read my dissertation. I yeah, that, that's right. That'll be the easiest <laughs> way, right? Oh, I just skipped. Oh, I did it. Hang on. Let me see if I can fix this. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, I usually... Well, first of all, the word is fulfilled. And when in we... In Matthew. Yeah. In Ma- and it's the word, the Greek word, plerao. And when we think of fulfilled, we usually think of the Old Testament passage refers to this passage. But... The word fulfilled can can also mean just to fill up, okay. um, like like it's, it's physically speaking. Yeah, in the New Testament, plerao can often mean to fill up a jug with mm. water or wine. Um, remember uh, uh, the wedding of Canaan? Um, oh yeah. He tells the um, um, uh, the servant or whatever to go get a, a jug and fill it with water. Well, yeah. That's what this word is. Mm. So it can have a ge- very general word meaning to fill up. And that's what I argue it means here. Yeah. So it's so it says that um, that Old Testament passage is now being filled up with Jesus also being God with us and come through. So it's yeah. it's not saying that this refers. Or well, it's not saying that this is a fulfillment of that meaning. Right. That that passage means this. Yeah. What I argue it means it means that that Old Testament passage has been filled up with more meaning by Jesus. And, right. and it can use that word Emmanuel, God with us, because in 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 some sense, there's in every sense, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of 
Emmanuel, God with us, right? That yeah, God that, is, that's a whole new meaning yeah. of that word, for sure. And, and, and I, I argue these are capped off, meaning there's no more uh, meaning that can be added to them. When, when, when you've got Jesus being God with us, there's nobody that can yeah. be more God with us than Jesus. So, right. so I would actually, at some point, these prophecies get capped off. Now, first of all, I've got to give you some evidence to show you yeah, yeah. what I'm saying. But, but first of all, just let me try to say that idea of uh, to fulfill or to fill up, I think makes a lot of sense in this passage because because mm. then the Old Testament passage makes perfect sense. Yeah, what he's doing, I, I call it a prophetic pattern, and what I mean by that, he's created a pattern back in the Old Testament, which now he is going to fill up with more meaning, and it's going to be capped off by Jesus being right. God with us. Right, is is what I'm arguing. Okay, and and it, and and there, uh, remember I told you that the word Alma back in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. meant young woman. A young woman is gonna is pregnant and about to have a, a child. Yeah. This one is using the... Uh, now it's... Um, in, in Matthew. Yeah, in Matthew. It's using the word parthenos, which, which usually in the New Testament means virgin. Yeah. Now, um, there is a little... I actually argue that the word parthenos has gone through a development mm-hmm. um, because in the Septuagint, Dinah is called a parthenos even after she was raped, hmm. we usually don't consider uh, a woman who's been raped as a, a virgin, sure. right? So so I think what's happened is that the word changed in meaning. It's modified its meaning. Now, we do that. Um, one of them that has changed its meaning significantly is gay. Hmm. You know, 100 years ago, it just meant happy or right, something right. like that. Yeah. Well, it totally means something different now. Right. Uh, another one that that's changed its meaning is, um, in, if you read the King James, you've probably heard, um, and the two will cleave together. Mm. And yet, when we, th- you know, that's thinking about the Genesis passage. Yeah. And, you know, but when we think of cleave, it's we usually separate. think of a meat yeah. cleaver right, that yeah. splits it apart. Yeah. So, so that word has once again changed 180 degrees. It yeah. meant this thing. Now it almost means something opposite. Yeah. So uh, words change in meaning and usage. And I think that this is one of the cases in it, 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 same in Greek and Hebrew, when those were live languages, they actually changed in meaning as they went along. So what I'm arguing is that the word play, uh, the word Parthenos started off meaning a young woman, hmm. pretty much. Then it's developed into clearly More specific, yeah, a virgin. Right. And and there's no doubt that um, that Jesus was born of a virgin. I mean, yeah. the whole context says, why would he ever put her away if yeah, if, right? You know, so so Joseph knows she's a virgin, or I mean, yeah. understands the word virgin. Yeah. Um, uh, and in verse 25 has it again, and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. Yeah. Well, what would that mean if it's not yeah. what we think it means? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I want to just make sure you know, the word Parthenos, cha- I think, developed in meaning, but then at, at a certain time, it gets frozen and, and we understand that it means a virgin. And it... And, and then the, all the context we have in Matthew seems to yeah. reflect that. And Luke also. Of the word. Luke yeah. also. Yeah. So both of them make that pretty clear yeah. that she's a virgin. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but then the other word that's even more important for what we're doing yeah. is that word to fill or to fill up, or it's our word play rao, yeah. the Greek word. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now let me give you some of the other evidence that's yeah. there. Okay, so there's a. There, it seems like Matthew is one of them that does this a lot. Mm. Um, so let's let's go to um, chapter two. Let's let's start at verse fourteen. Okay. okay? So it says, so Joseph got into uh, got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and uh, and left for Egypt. Okay, the, remember the angel told him to go, and so yeah. that's that context. All right, and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Mm. Out of Egypt I called my son. So we still got that word plerao. Yep. Okay, and then out of Egypt I call my son. Well, if you go go ahead and go to uh, Hosea eleven one. And, and this is where the quote comes from. So go ahead and read it. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That's pretty clear, right? It's talking about Israel. Yeah. 
So I had teachers that would argue, well, um, uh, Jesus was in the loins of Israel when it mm. came out of Egypt. And I, okay, maybe that's possible, but I don't think that's what it's getting at. I think right. what it's saying is that this passage is to fill it up with more meaning. Right. So that one was fine. Israel was brought out of Egypt uh, in the Exodus. But here he's saying when, um, when Jesus went to Egypt, now at, when he came back, it was to fill it up with more meaning out of Egypt, I called my son. Yeah. I'm thinking of another passage. I think it's in Matthew. Okay. Let's see if I... Jonah? And, uh, you know, it says Jesus will be down for three days like, like yeah. Jonah was. Yeah. Which is another kind of very specific reference... Yeah, it's. I, I guess I don't know if it's saying it's fulfilled yeah, in the same I, kind of it, way. It, you know? it, well, it didn't say that that one is a fulfillment of it. Okay, yeah, that, yeah. that's why I don't. Oh, that's just like a saying kind of more like it's yeah. metaphorical. Yeah, yeah, in the same way, kind of. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, let me show you some more. Okay, yeah. so that's one that seems pretty clear to me. Yeah. Okay. Now let's let's go again. The next one is in verse eighteen, but let's build up to it again. Okay, so let's start at sixteen. And then, and, and when Herod uh, saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinities from two years old and under, according to the time which, the, uh, uh, which he had determined uh, from the Magi. Uh, then it had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was um, then that which was spoken uh, through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Well, I have a problem here. First of all, it's, it's Jeremiah. It's talking about Ramah, not Bethlehem. So why, mm. why does it pull a completely different you know, time out? And, and, and Rachel weeping for her children. Okay, okay, what's this mean? Well, remember in Jeremiah's time, what was happening is that the people were being taken off in captivity, right? Because that's in Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah is about 600, and so it's talking about the exodus or the exile, exile. from yeah, into Babylon, remember? Yeah. And when they did, they went to a, a place called Rama. It was a holding place mm. where before they went all the way over to Babylon, they would keep them there and get them in groups and then send them over. Well, so when this, uh, this passage is saying, here's Rachel weeping for her, this is to fulfill what was said uh, by Jeremiah, uh, a voice was heard in Rama, uh, weeping in great mourning. Well, well she's, uh, you know, Rachel weeping for her children, that would be the Israelites, because they're being taken off into captivity. Yeah. Well, how does that, how does, how does um, our passage here, how does this, you know, when they kill all the babies in Bethlehem, uh, how does that fulfill... What's happening here? Well, it, it, it's not a this for that kind of thing. What yeah. it is, it means to fill it up with more meaning. Yeah. So we've got a, we've got a, a, a prophecy here that's beca become what I call a prophetic pattern that then is filled up with more meaning by the New Testament context yeah. and what happened there. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's two of them I've tried to show you. There's mm -hmm. a there's a third one and it's it's a little harder. Those those two I think are the clearest. Yeah. Um, right at the end, there's a, a verse twenty three uses that word fulfilled again. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, he was. Uh, it's, it says that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father, so he's afraid to go there. Okay. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee, and he, and he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Hmm. Now, you can go through the prophets, and you'll never find a place where the Messiah or hmm. Jesus is supposed to be called a Nazarene. So it's just not there. Yeah. But I believe what it is, is it's a play on words. If you go to Isaiah chapter 11, he said, it says that a nezer is going to uh, sprout up and, and uh, uh, come... Um, well, it, it says he's going to sprout up and, and become... And, and in chapter 11, it sounds like it's the Messiah. So okay. he's springing up and he's going he's gonna to have the belt of truth around him and all that mm. kind of stuff. So, so what is this getting at? Well, it seems like to me, it's a play on the word nezer, uh, hmm. which usually means branch or sprout or oh, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's a play on the words. Once, once again, the Hebrew mindset would have caught that and saw that nezer 
Nazarene was a play on the words. Yeah. We miss it because we yeah, yeah. we don't know that branch or sprout means nezer, right. you know, is the Hebrew word nezer. So I think that's what's going on, on there. And once again, it's to fill it up with more meaning. Right. Now, there's, there's three passages right in our context that helps us, I think, understand that word play rao better. Yeah. Now, it seems like to me, if I'm going to really prove this to you, that I better show you a place when they, where they don't do it, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, so if we go to chapter 2 and we start at verse 4, okay, mm-hmm. gathering... Of Matthew. Matthew y- yeah, I'm sorry, Matthew 2, yep, 4. Gathering together the uh, uh, chief priests and scribes of the people... Uh, uh, yeah, scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Notice our word play ra'u isn't there. Yeah. And and then it says, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. Out of you shall come forth a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. I think that's a direct fulfillment. So, so if you go to um, Jeremiah, uh, Micah yeah. five, no, it's oh, Micah five two. If you go to Micah five two, I think it's it's not talking about anyone in its context. It's talking about the Messiah, and so when when the author wants you to know it's a direct fulfillment, he says uh, this is what has been written by the prophet. Yeah, that is a different. You, yeah, you don't use the word play rot at all. Yeah. So it seems like to me, we've got examples where play rot was used that has a filling up of the meaning, and then you have other examples where it just says, and this is what the prophet said, yeah. or what was written by the prophet. Yeah, okay? that's very interesting, and, and it's pretty clear. I mean, certainly it, it seems like Matthew has yeah. a lot of precision yeah. in how he's using the Old Testament. And that's what I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue we have missed it. Yeah. We, we didn't understand how Matthew was using the word play rao. And, mm-hmm. and, and shame on us, because all it would have taken is to go to a lexicon and look up what the, words, what the word play rao means. Yeah. We, we thought we understood it, that it was a fulfillment of the passage, when a lot of times it just means to fill it. Yeah. And, and I think that's what's happening here. So then let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. In Isaiah... Why do we see virgin in our English yeah. translations? <laughs> That's because, well, all right. Uh, translations are made by people, yeah. right? And, and I can actually, I, I don't know about the NASB, but I do know about the NIV. I actually, mm. I actually talked with a guy named um, Louis Goldberg, who is one of the translators mm. of the NIV, and he said they spent a month trying to decide whether they were going to say virgin there or young woman. Mm. They knew the word Alma meant young woman, yeah. but they also knew what happened back in 1951 when the RSV put virgin there, or I'm sorry, put a young, woman. young woman there, and they, they were liberal, or called a liberal Bible because they did uh-huh. that. And, and that was one of the passages. There was another one, Matthew, uh, John 3.16, where they, they actually, when they had um, God's only begotten son, and they just said God's only son. Mm. And and that was another thing that caused them to be... Uh, the problem with that one is that it, it's that w- same word is used for Jairus' daughter, mm. and it was his only daughter. So so you're using the same Greek word, monogenes, right. for both of them. Yeah. And so, so all I can tell you is that they knew that that, that was going to... that would. See, Bible translations are no good if nobody reads them. So they have to be right. real careful that if yeah. they if they step on a landmine, yeah. that it that people aren't going to use their Bible. So what good is it to do to translate it that way? Right. So even though we well, know, and, and know what the Hebrew is, we got to be careful how we translate. Translation from an ancient language is not exactly a one to one. No, it's it very isn't. complicated. You yeah, know? and like we have to kind of make. Decisions, steps, you know, and, and, and walk from an idiom maybe yeah, in an yeah. ancient language. It just won't, yeah, won't be super clear. And I mean, one of the things we have to do, what we've been talking about, is some of the yeah. you know techniques that maybe yeah you see in Hebrew. And there's a there's a way we try to translate it to clue people in in English. But that's it's just a very difficult yeah. To di- and there's not always like a absolute answer. Yeah. On this one though. Mm. There was an intentional, yeah. It, but but it's I understand why they knew the New Testament said that this was to fulfill, and mm. that a virgin, a play, you know, Parthenos was was uh, born and she's call, or is pregnant. Is going to call his name Emmanuel. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I understand why they did it. Yeah. 
But I think they should have looked deeper to find out why Matthew was say what Matthew was saying, mm. because in actual fact, it's not it's not bad. It's not it's it's not saying that this is a fulfillment of that. It means this is a filling up of that, and 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 that's what the Greek language meant. I think. So do you think? Would you say really the issue is our understanding of the word fulfill, and yes. maybe even translation of yes fulfill rather than yeah. Uh, our words, maybe in, in both Old Testament and New Testament here, of yeah. virgin, Alma, yeah. and what was the one in Greek again? Uh, Par- Parthenos. Parthenos. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was that we weren't clear on what was going on. Yeah. And that so we thought we knew what was going on, so we translated it certain ways, but mm-hmm. that that's one of the reasons why I, did, I wrote my dissertation, though, because I, I didn't have an answer. I, had, I couldn't figure out what was going on here. Yeah. So... Yeah. Took me a while, but I think I yeah. do well, have it's an a complex, answer. Yeah, 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 it's a complex uh, problem. It's a very complicated <laughs> issue. Yeah, 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 and it, it has a lot of ramifications. Yeah, so for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's why that's why the title of my of my paper are yeah. there two virgin births. I mean, if if that means virgin back in, the, in Isaiah's time, and there was a child born at that time, that was a so we'd have a problem. Yeah. So which which is I, I think kind of ties into that. This idea that I have that like most most problems we come across in the Bible, I think have answers, but they're yeah they're not always easy. easy. That's right, and you really have to study and yeah get deep into it to start to figure out what's yeah what's going. On. And and I do think you don't necessarily have to have an advanced degree in Hebrew or yeah. Hebrew and Greek. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. To do yeah, this, right. you know, if you use a couple of English translations, you know, yeah. and you're accessing other sources, you, you can probably piece a lot of this stuff together. And, yeah. and and of course, like a lot of people have, a lot of people have thought about this and tried to ad- yeah. address these issues and come up with different, you know, yeah. different answers to see how yeah. it all fits together, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. a very serious, you know, very serious study. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it took me a long time to yeah, figure it out. I'm <laughs> so, sure, yeah. yeah. So I, I certainly can't knock them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Well, should we go? Does that all make sense? Or should I we? think so. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's. Uh, yeah, that works out pretty well for me. All right. Should we go back to our passage in Isaiah? Yeah. yeah 7? Let's go back. Let's go back we to still Isaiah got seven. A few more verses we need to talk about. Mm-hmm. So we've talked about verse fourteen through seventeen. Those ones, in my mind, are crucial to understanding that it actually was fulfilled at that time. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That it actually made sense to Ahaz. All right. And then we follow that up with yeah, those, in that day. Yeah, and we've got four of them. I think that's kind of interesting to help us. All right. So verse 18, in that day, the Lord will whistle for a fly that is in the remotest parts of the river of Egypt. So he's calling from, now, he's going to call it a fly and a bee. And a fly is less irritating probably or dangerous than a bee. Yeah. Um, but I'll bet it means more like a horse fly that bites. Yeah. So, so, so it still is irritating. Yeah. Okay. All right. But notice it's from Egypt. And for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So we he's talking about two countries coming together. Well, when did Egypt and Assyria come? It came they came in 701 mm. and they came and filled the land. So when it said in that day, it's talking about the day that the king of Assyria is coming. And they will come and settle in the deep ravines and the ledges and the cliffs and all the thorn bushes and all the watering places. So so basically that passage is just saying how. Egypt and, and Assyria are going to come into Israel, or actually Judah at this point, yeah. and fill the land. That's basically oh, all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but There's, in that day, yeah. 701, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because you wouldn't necessarily want to settle on a steep ravine. Yeah, that's true. nowhere else to... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that just means how many are there, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, look at verse 20. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from the regions beyond the Euphrates. Now, what what is beyond the Euphrates? Assyria. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because Babylon is over there too. So oh, it, it yeah. may have ramifications. I think it's left general enough. But the time that it's talking about here, 701, that would be the Assyrians. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, and, and it helps us. That is the king of Assyria, so it actually even told yeah. us. Yeah. All <laughs> yeah. right. And the head of, and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove its beard. Now, uh, to shave a Jewish person would be, that, and shave it like this, totally all the hair off, yeah. would be really embarrassing. You remember yeah. those spies that were say, sent to Haran? Oh, yeah. and, and remember, um, it, it said that they shaved off 
uh, the king of Haram, and it, it said half they shaved off half their beards mm-hmm. during a, uh, David's time. Yeah. And uh, David says to stay in uh, Jericho until your beard grows back, and then you can come back in. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. that gives you some clue of how yeah. embarrassing that would have been. Yeah. Okay. So God is going. Yeah. So God is going to hire the Assyrian. <laughs> yeah. Right. God is going to hire. The <laughs> I'm Assyrian. bald for all the yeah. listeners. I shaved my head. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's not watching the video. But as he goes down, he didn't shave at all because the, the beard's still there. <laughs> all right, um, back to here. <laughs> all right, so we've got um, that God is going to use the Assyrians to, to shave Judah. So that lets you know, it, shaving, that, that would mean a clean cut and yeah. wipe out quite a bit. Yeah. And in 701, once, once again, it did that. He had, if you remember... Uh, Jerusalem is the only one that's left after Assyrian has wiped out all the other uh, parts of it. Yeah. So all the other cities were destroyed but Jerusalem. Right. Okay. Right. So that, once again, that fits really well. Now, verse 21. Now, in that day, a man would keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep, and because of the abundance of milk produced, he will eat curds, and, uh, he will eat curds, and everybody that is left in the land will eat curds and honey. Okay, so, so that sounds okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, right, it, but yeah. I think it probably means this is not very many people. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. Because if a if a if a heifer and a pair of sheep, I, I actually figured that out. It's about seven gallons of milk. Yeah, so okay. not really. Yeah, that much, but but it's it plenty is, for a yeah. It is few saying of people that a few are going to stay be left. Yeah. and and isn't that that exactly what it, the author wants to tell us that mm. in seven hundred one Jerusalem will be left. But the rest is going to be wiped out. Yeah. So he's saying a remnant will be left, and so it fits really well. Um, so everybody that is left, and, and notice it twice. It makes you, sure you know that uh, first, uh, it is only a heifer and a pair of sheep. So that's not very many. Yeah. Right. But then it says uh, everyone that is left within the land. So that makes it sound like something happened. Yeah. Then now we only got a few left. All right. Okay. All right. Then last one is verse twenty-three. And it will come about in that day that every place where there used to be a thousand vines valued at a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. Well, I, I, I don't know if when it says valued at a thousand, I don't know if that means that, that each vine will produce um, uh, enough wine to get you a thousand shekels of silver. I don't know if yeah. that's what it means or if it means, you know, a thousand this, vine. Yeah, this vine is worth a thousand. Oh, I see. I yeah, mean, yeah. that could be the other possibility. So it says, and th- there used to be a thousand vines vowed at a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. Yeah. But the abundant, which, thing yeah, will which, be uh, gone. yeah, whatever it means, yeah. uh, you know, exactly that phrase. When it says they're going to become briars and thorns, yeah. that phrase we already saw and talked about. Yeah. Basically, the nation is going to be wiped out. Yeah. And and briars and thorns are going to be there because there's nobody to harvest the yeah. stuff and and fix them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. People will come with bows and air, and and arrows uh, because all the land will be briars and thorns. The second thing. So it's it's basically just going to revert back to wildlife so yeah. that they can go hunt animals there. Oh, okay? I see. Yeah. And okay. And as for the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, there will uh, they will not go there for fears of briars and thorns. <laughs> you just keep getting that phrase briars and thorns again to let you know the land is wasted. Yeah. Okay. But they will become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. So basically useless land or pasture land. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we just had three pictures of what it's going to be like in, in that, that day. day. That is 701. Yeah. Okay. Now, does that all make sense? So we've, we just got to the end of a very complicated chapter. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it seems to fit in too. It's like, it doesn't seem like pure desolation in this last section, but it is kind of the people are gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe the, I don't know if we'd say the idea of the nation, but certainly as it was, yeah. as like a people with a place, yeah. you know, that's kind of, that period is over for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, remember in 701, um, that's still not the uh, time they're going into Babylon in captivity. Right. So so the nation will be destroyed, mm. left for a while as briars and thorns, but it will spring back. I mean, it, yeah. it does come back anyway. Yeah, yeah. Until... Now, yeah. In, now, let's just, let's just summarize once again. So what we okay. talked about, we talked about the Syrophimite War, where yeah. the northern kingdom, Israel, and Syria, the kingdom just north of that, 
come down against Judah, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, King Ahaz is there. He's scared. He's scared to death. Him and his people are scared, yeah. so you know why. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because they, he doesn't want to join with their coalition to fight against the Assyrians, Yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the context. And then later, we're going to have the Syria-Fermite War, and that actually starts when, Sir when us Syria... Well, actually, I, I didn't even tell you this, but Ahaz at some point calls upon the Assyrians to come over and wipe out uh, Damascus. Mm. So he actually pays them off, it says uh, in the historical books. So mm. he, he, he pays them money to come across and he and heads to Damascus. That's why at a certain point, these people must have taken off, um, you know, because they never do fight against Jerusalem. And, and yeah. it's probably because they hear the Assyrians are coming against Damascus. So, so it'd be silly to stay down here. We're saying Syrian army comes down into Ephraim. Uh -huh. Then they're kind of right on the border yep. of Judah. Okay. And then Emmanuel, right? The child is born. Okay. And then the armies disperse or they leave, right? That's the sign to Ahaz. Yeah. And you're kind of saying the historical context around that is probably Assyria has come in from the north. Yes. So the armies had to go. Yeah. And Ahaz asked for that. Yes. Because that's interesting. That's <laughs> He's not even paid necessarily him. in here, you yeah. know. Yeah, right. You don't see it here. Um, there is a part, passage in Second Kings that actually talks about yeah. him paying them to come over and destroy them. And I guess most of the context here really we're seeing is Isaiah talking to Ahaz. Right. Saying, yeah. don't be afraid. Did you notice how God was so gracious to Ahaz? Mm. He knew he was afraid, but he gave him like six different things to yeah. help build his courage, and he still... Yeah. Calls on the Assyrians. Right. Right. Yeah. Even when he asked him to do a sign, ask a sign yeah. from whatever you want and I'll do it. This is the only time that I know that God asks a person to ask him to have a sign. Yeah. And man, that's amazing. Yeah. That's God bending over backwards. It makes it even funnier, really, <laughs> that he's like, no, I can't do that. Yeah. You said not to do, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like, but God saying, yeah. you know, like he's, he's kind of, and he's being disobedient yeah. right there, you know? Yeah. Hmm. If God ever asks you if you want to have a sign, yeah, you know. better take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially if there's a marism involved. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> there that, you, go. you know, from the bottom to the top, <laughs> yeah. ask anything, you know? Yeah. Well, does the passage make some sense? I think so, yeah. So we get through that, and then we come to the end. This last section is basically describing what the end of that sign is, yeah. right? The sign is going to happen yeah. in probably around 701. Yeah. Um, we know the king of Assyria is coming in, and this is what the state of the world is going to be. Their world is yeah. going to be, essentially, Yeah. Um, when that comes through. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. Okay. It's complicated. It is. It's yeah. a tough passage, but... It's a rich one. I mean, if you ask mm -hmm. me, and then to see how the New Testament uses it. Yeah. In my mind, what that's doing then is they're, they're taking passages from the Old Testament, and they make what I call a prophetic pattern out of them, and then fill them with more meaning. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of interesting. You don't see that very many times in the Bible. So, yeah. so you've got a Matthew using that word play rao to fill these, these passages that had already happened yeah. with even more meaning. And yeah. I think that's... I think that's neat. I think that could be preached really well too. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, that's a cool idea. So, have you ever preached through the Book of Isaiah? No, not the whole thing. Or like sections of, yeah, sections of it. Yeah, I've done parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Is that kind of how you step into? Yeah. Talking about Christ, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can do that. Yeah, uh, seven is good. Uh, you know, almost everybody's preached on chapter six, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I've done that. Yeah. But but seven, I think, would be a good one to yeah. to get them. And and people don't understand it, so it's, so it'd yeah. be really helpful for them to to hear a good sermon on it, so that they could have a better understanding of it. Well, and I've always thought when you're preaching. It's probably the, not necessarily the primary thing you're trying to do, but you are teaching people how to read yeah. the text and yeah. how they ought to interpret and understand yeah. the text. So, so I do think there could be value in that yeah. to kind of show, you know, just bring in some of that nuance and, and then just to remind people, like, you can, maybe test isn't the right word, but you can, you can really go deep into Scripture and yeah. it's going to hold up. Yeah. You know, you can trust it in that kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, and that, see, then, that, then that helps you to know how come how Matthew is using it and all that. Yeah. So rather than thinking, 
it's a mistake or how can both these be fulfilled? Because yeah. I, I remember I have teachers that I, I, I think even when my, in my PhD, I think they thought there was a mistake here. Well, you know? and, and it's like even past that, it's just to engage in that level to understand that there's something a little bit yeah. odd in, in this. Yeah. Because I, I imagine a lot of, I'm, I'll speak from my own experience. Yeah. I don't think I had ever really considered it. Mm. I could never taken those steps that, like, you read in Matthew, like, yeah. this is, you know, I'm going to quote Isaiah here. Yeah. And, like, it never even, I, I had never even thought, like, oh, is he saying that there's another virgin yeah. birth? <laughs> uh, you know, I just, like, you just kind of, I, I guess I was reading at such a shallow or kind of surface level, uh, I just went right past it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isaiah must have said this, yeah. like, just some, like, this thing's going to happen one day, you guys. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'll just, just write it down, I guess. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, someone someone will figure it out. But it's you know there was there was yeah. a meaning and context. Yeah. Uh, of the Old Testament, you know, and specifically in this this chapter that that totally yeah. would have made sense to the people who were who were reading it and who read it between yeah. you know Isaiah saying it and yeah. Jesus being born. You know, I, I probably need to to be fair. I need to also tell you there are others that have tried to figure out different ways that it's. Hmm. How to explain it? You know, oh, yeah, yeah. good people. Uh, you know, good scholars see yeah. that there's a problem here, yeah. and good scholars disagree on how it should be answered. Yeah. This is the way I've answered it. Other people to see it as like a double fulfillment. You know, mm, it's, yeah, yeah. it was fulfilled there, but it's now it's been fill, er, fulfilled again. Yeah. I don't think that answers the question very well. Mm. Um, some people uh, see it as as uh, almost like a type that then is is explained further in the New Testament. Mm. So they've got that kind of an image. Yeah. Um, so there's a variety of ways they try to explain the issue. Yeah. Um, this is what I've done, and this is what I think makes the most sense to me. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, and I guess if people want to learn more, they can look up your dissertation. The com- you know? or, or the commentary. It's yeah. going to have it in Yeah, that's true, too. the commentary, yeah. So. It'll be in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we did cover a lot today, and yeah. I think... If I'm thinking about this correctly, we have chapter eight next. Yes. Uh, for our next episode, uh, and that will kind of complete our five through twelve. Is that right? Or we, do we need uh, no, a no. little bit more in nine? Yeah, we we still have a little in nine. Oh, because uh, our our well, how do we do that? We did a woe oracles. Yeah, ten, we I think we did those already, then, um, but we should should still do uh, chapter nine. Okay. There's so, a little a portion in there that's I think, and and it goes from chapter eight. Right into chapter into nine. nine. Yeah. So do you think we'll do that next yeah. episode? Kind of. Yeah. We'll finish it out. We'll do all of chapter eight and, and a nine, nine, one through kinda. seven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now let me let me tell you for your ex, uh, for your work. Yeah. Right. You, you want to do oh, some yeah. homework? I'm yeah. sure. So read chapter eight mm-hmm. and the be- and right into chapter nine. Okay. And then um, let me just give you a hint. I'm going to argue that chapters eight is is going to go over the same material we just went over. Only okay. now, uh, in a different way, and I actually argue it's even closer than it was then, because mm. this time it says that um, uh, before before he knows the difference between good and bad, or whatever that means, that phrase. Mm-hmm. Uh, in chapter eight, it says before he can say "mommy and daddy." Oh, we, and "mommy and daddy," kids yeah, can yeah. usually say that a year old. Yeah. So it seems like to me the second sign here that we're going to talk about is even closer to okay. it. So. Okay. So maybe. Yeah. Definitely read eight in the beginning of nine. Yeah. Maybe also go ahead and read seven again. Yeah, as that'd part of that, kind of see how these things yeah. are going to be related. Just, yeah, just remind yourself that Cyrie from my war that, yeah. that now is the context for both of these signs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. I think that's great. Uh, that's good work. Uh, until we're all back together again on the next episode. Okay. Uh, again, thank you to everybody and. Uh, We'll see you or hear you, or you'll hear us, I guess, (laughs) next time as we uh, continue to study Isaiah. Isaiah.